Chapter 11 Faith and Unfaith At Jane Witherstein's home, the promise made to Mrs. Larkin to care for little Fay had begun to be fulfilled. Like a gleam of sunlight through the cottonwoods was the coming of the child to the gloomy house of Witherstein. The big, silent halls echoed with childish laughter. In the shady court, where Jane spent many of the hot July days, Fay's tiny feet pattered over the stone flags and splashed in the amber stream. She prattled incessantly. What difference, Jane thought, a child made in her home. It had never been a real home, she discovered, even the tidiness and neatness she had so observed, and upon which she had insisted to her women, became, in the light of Faye's smile, habits that had now lost their importance. Faye littered the courtyard with Jane's books and papers and other toys her fancy improvised, and many a strange craft went floating down the little brook. And it was owing to Faye's presence that Jane Witherstein came to see more of Lassiter. The writer had for the most part kept to the sage. He rode for her, but he did not seek her except on business. Jane had to acknowledge in pique that her overtures had been made in vain. Faye, however, captured Lassiter the moment he first laid eyes on her. Jane was present at the meeting, and there was something about it which dimmed her sight and softened her toward this foe of her people. The writer had clanked into the court, a tired yet wary man, always looking for the attack upon him that was inevitable and might come from any quarter, and he had walked right upon little Fay. The child had been beautiful even in her rags and amid surroundings of the hovel in the sage. But now, in a pretty white dress, with her shining curls brushed and her face clean and rosy, she was lovely. She left her play and looked up at Lassiter. If there was not an instinct for all three of them in that meeting, an unreasonable tendency towards a closer intimacy, then Jane Witherstein believed she had been subject to a queer fancy. She imagined any child would have feared Lassiter, and Faye Larkin had been a lonely, solitary elf of the sage, not at all an ordinary child and exquisitely shy with strangers. She watched Lassiter with great, round, grave eyes, but showed no fear. The writer gave Jane a favorable report of cattle and horses, and as he took the seat to which she invited him, little Fay edged as much as a half an inch nearer. Jane replied to his look of inquiry and told Fay's story. The writer's grave, earnest gaze troubled her. Then he turned to Fay and smiled in a way that made Jane doubt her sense of the true relation of things. How could Lassiter smile so at a child when he had made so many children fatherless? But he did smile and to the gentleness she had seen a few times he added something that was infinitely sad and sweet. Jane's intuition told her that Lassiter had never been a father, but if life ever so blessed him, he would be a good one. Fay also, must have found that smile singularly winning, for she edged closer and closer, and then, by way of feminine capitulation, went to Jane, from whose side she bent a beautiful glance upon the rider. Lassiter only smiled at her. Jane watched them and realized that now was the moment she should seize if she was ever to win this man from his hatred, but the step was not easy to take. The more she saw of Lassiter, the more she respected him, and the greater her respect, the harder it came to lend herself to mere coquetry. Yet as she thought of her great motive, of toll, of that other whose name she had scolded herself never to think of in connection with Millie Ernst's avenger, she suddenly found she had no choice, and her creed gave her boldness far beyond the limit to which vanity would have led her. Lassiter, I so see little of you now, she said, and was conscious of heat in her cheeks. I've been riding hard, he replied. But you can't live in the saddle. You come in sometimes. Won't you come here to see me oftener? Is that an order? Nonsense. I simply ask you to come to see me when you find time. Why? The query once heard was not so embarrassing to Jane as she might have imagined. Moreover, it established in her mind a fact that there existed actually other than selfish reasons for her wanting to see him. And as she had been bold, so she determined to be both honest and brave. I've reasons, only one of which I need mention, she answered. If it's possible, I want to change you toward my people. And on the moment I can conceive of little, I wouldn't do to gain that end. How much better and freer Jane felt after that confession. She meant to show him that there was one Mormon who could play a game or wage a fight in the open. I reckon, said Lassiter, and he laughed. It was the best in her, if the most irritating that Lassiter always aroused. 
Will you come? She looked into his eyes, and for the life of her could not quite subdue an imperiousness that rose with her spirit. I never asked so much of any man, except Burn Venner's. Appears to me that you'd run no risk, or Venner's either, but maybe that doesn't hold good for me. You mean it wouldn't be safe for you to... You mean it wouldn't be safe for you to be here often? You mean it wouldn't be safe for you to be often here? You look you look for ambush in the cottonwoods? Not that so much. A disjuncture little face sidled over to Lassiter. Has you a little girl? she inquired. Has you a little girl? she inquired. No, Lassie, replied the writer. Whatever face seemed to be searching for in Lassiter's sun-reddened face, in quiet eyes she evidently found. Oot to to see me, she added, and with that shyness gave place to friendly curiosity. First his sombrero with its leather band and silver ornaments commanded her attention, next his quirt, and then the clinking silver spurs. These held her for some time, but presently, Due to childish fickleness, she left off playing with them to look for something else. She laughed in glee as she ran her little hands down the slippery, shiny surface of Lassiter's leather chaps. Soon she discovered one of the hanging gun sheaths, and she dragged it and began tugging at the huge black handle of the gun. Jane Witherstein repressed, it. Jane Witherstein repressed an exclamation. What significance was there in little... What significance there was to her and the little girl's efforts to dislodge that heavy weapon. Jane Witherstein saw Faye's play and her beauty and her love as um, as most powerful allies to her own woman's part in a game that suddenly had acquired a strange vest a strange zest and a hint of danger and a hint of danger. And as for the writer, he appeared to have forgotten Jane in the wonder of this lovely child. He appeared to have forgotten Jane in the wonder of this lovely child playing above him. Playing about him. At first he was much the shyer of the two. Gradually her confidence overcame his backwardness, and he had the temerity to stroke her golden curls with a great hand. Faye rewarded his boldness with a smile. And then he had gone to the extreme of closing that great hand over her little brown one. She said simply, I like you. Sight of his face then made Jane oblivious for the time to his character as a hater of Mormons. Out of the mother longing that swelled her breast, she divined the child hunger in Lassiter. He returned the next day and the next, and upon the following he came both at morning and at night. Upon the evening of this fourth day, Jane seemed to feel the breaking of a brooding struggle in Lassiter. During all these visits, he had scarcely a word to say, though he watched her and played absent-mindedly with Faye. Jane had contented herself with silence. Soon little Faye substituted for the expression of regard. I like you, a warmer and more generous one. I love you. Thereafter, Lassiter came oftener to see Jane and her little protege. Daily he grew more gentle and kind and gradually developed a quaintly merry mood. In the morning he lifted Faye upon his horse and let her ride as he walked beside her to the edge of the sage. In the evening he played with the child at an infinite variety of games she invented, and then, oftener than not, he accepted Jane's invitation to supper. No other visitor came to Witherstein House during these days, so that in spite of the watchfulness he never forgot, Lassiter began to show he felt at home there. After the meal they walked into the grove of cottonwoods or up by the lakes, and little Fay held Lassiter's hand as much as she held Jane's. Thus a strange relationship was established, and Jane liked it. At twilight they always returned to the house, where Fay kissed them and went in to her mother. Lassiter and Jane were left alone. Then, if there were anything that a good woman could do to win a man and still preserve her self-respect, it was something which escaped the natural subtlety of a woman determined to allure. Jane's vanity, that after all was not great, was soon satisfied with Lassiter's silent admiration, and her honest desire to lead him from his stark, blood-stained path would never have blinded her to what she owed herself. But the driving passion of her religion, 
and its call to save Mormon lives, one life in particular, bore Jane Withersteen close to an infringement of her womanhood. In the beginning, she had reasoned that her appeal to Lassiter must be through the senses. With whatever means she possessed in the way of adornment, she enhanced her beauty, and she stooped to artifices that she knew were unworthy of her, but which she deliberately chose to employ. She made herself a girl in every variable mood wherein a girl might be desirable. In those moods she was not above the methods of an inexperienced, though natural, flirt. She kept close to him whenever opportunity afforded, and she was forever playful, yet passionately underneath the surface, fighting him for possession of the great black guns. These he would never yield to her, and so in that manner their hands were often and long in contact. The more of simplicity that she sensed in him, the greater the advantage she took. She had a trick of changing, and it was not altogether voluntary, from this gay, thoughtless, girlish coquettishness to the silence and the brooding, burning mystery of a woman's mood. The strength and passion and fire of her were in her eyes, and she so used them that Lassiter had to see this depth in her, this haunting promise more fitted to her years than to the flaunting guise of a Wilford girl. The July days flew by. Jane reasoned that if it were possible for her to be happy during such a time, then she was happy. Little Faye completely filled a long, aching void in her heart. In fettering the hands of this last litter, she was accomplishing the greatest good of her life, and to do good, even in a small way, rendered happiness to Jane Witherstein. She had attended the regular Sunday services of her church, otherwise she had not gone to the village for weeks. It was unusual that none of her churchmen or friends had called upon her of late, but it was neglect for which she was glad. Judkins and his boy riders had experienced no difficulty in driving the white herd, so these warm July days were free of worry, and soon Jane hoped that she had passed the crisis. And for her to hope was presently to trust, and then to believe. She thought often of Venner's, but in a dreamy, abstract way. She spent hours teaching and playing with little Fay, and the activities of her mind centered around Lassiter. The direction she had given her will seemed to blunt any branching off of thought from that straight line. The mood came to obsess her. In the end, when her awakening came, she learned that she had built it better than she knew. Lassiter, though kinder and gentler than ever, had parted with his quaint humor and his coldness and his tranquility to become a restless and unhappy man. Whatever the power of his deadly intent toward Mormons, that passion now had a rival, the one equally burning and consuming. Jane Witherstein had one moment of exultation before the dawn of a strange uneasiness. What if she had made herself a lure, at tremendous cost to him and to her, and all in vain? That night, in the moonlit grove, she summoned all her courage, and, turning suddenly in the path, she faced Lassiter and leaned close to him, so that she touched him and her eyes looked up to his. "'Lassiter, will you do anything for me?' In the moonlight she saw his dark-worn face change, and by that change she seemed to feel him immovable as a wall of stone. Jane slipped her hands down to the swinging gun sheaths, and when she had locked her fingers round the huge, cold handles of the guns, she trembled as if with a chilling ripple over all her body. "'May I take your guns?' "'Why?' he asked, and for the first time to her his voice carried a harsh note. Jane felt his hard, strong hands close around her wrists. It was not wholly with intent that she leaned toward him, for the look in his eyes and the feel of his hands made her weak. It's no trifle, no woman's whim. It's deep. As my heart, let me take them. Why? I want to keep you from killing more men, Mormons. You must let me save you from more wickedness, more wanton bloodshed. Then the truth forced itself falteringly from her lips. You must let me help you to keep my vow to Millie Earn. I swore to her, as she lay dying, that if ever anyone came to avenge her, I swore I would stay his hand. Perhaps I, I alone can save the man who, who, oh, Lassiter, I feel that I can't change you. Then soon you'll be out to kill, and you'll kill by instinct, and among the Mormons you kill will be the one who, Lassiter, if you care a little for me, let me, for my sake, let me take your guns. As if her hands had been those of a child, he unclasped their clinging grip from the handles of his guns, and pushing her away, he and pushing her away, he turned his gray face to her in one look of terrible realization, then strode off into the shadows of the cottonwoods. When the first shock of her futile appeal to Lassiter had passed, Jane took his cold, silent condemnation and abrupt departure, not so much as a refusal to her entreaty, as a hurt and stunned bitterness for her attempt at his betrayal. 
Upon further thought and slow consideration of Lassiter's past actions, she believed he would return and forgive her. The man could not be hard to a woman, and she doubted that he could stay away from her. But at that point where she had hoped to find him vulnerable, she now began to fear he was proof against all persuasion. The iron and stone quality that she had earlier suspected in him had actually cropped out as an impregnable barrier. Nevertheless, if Lassiter remained in Cottonwoods, she would never give up her hope and desire to change him. She would change him if she had to sacrifice everything dear to her except hope of heaven. Passionately devoted as she was to her religion, she had yet refused to marry a Mormon. But a situation had developed wherein self paled in the great white light of religious duty of the highest order. This was the leading motive, the divine and spiritual one. But there were other motives, which, like tentacles, aided in drawing her will to the acceptance of a possible abnegation. And through the watches of that sleepless night, Jane Witherstein, in fear and sorrow and doubt, came finally to believe that if she must throw herself into Lassiter's arms to make him abide by Thou shalt not kill, she would yet do well. In the morning she expected Lassiter at the usual hour, but she was not able to go at once to the court, so she sent little Fay. Mrs. Larkin was ill and required attention. It appeared that the mother, from the time of her arrival at Witherstein House, had relaxed and was slowly losing her hold on life. Jane had believed that the absence of worry and responsibility, coupled with good nursing and comfort, would mend Mrs. Larkin's broken health. Such, however, was not the case. When Jane did go out to the court, Fay was there alone, and at the moment, embarking on a dubious voyage down the stone-lined amber stream, upon a craft of two brooms and a pillow. Fay was delightfully wet as she could possibly wish to get. Clatter of hoofs distracted Fay and interrupted the scolding she was gleefully receiving from Jane. The sound was not the light-spirited trot that Bells made when Lassiter rode him into the outer court. This was slower and heavier, and Jane did not recognize it in any of her other horses. The appearance of Bishop Dyer startled Jane. He dismounted with his rapid, jerky motion, flung the bridle, and as he turned toward the inner court and stalked up on the stone flags, his boots rang. In his authoritative front, and in the red anger unmistakably flaming in his face, he reminded Jane of her father. "'Is that the Larkin popper?' he said brusquely, without any greeting to Jane. "'It's Mrs. Larkin's little girl,' Jane replied slowly. "'I hear you intend to raise the child?' "'Yes.' Do you mean to give her Mormon upbringing? No. His questions had been swift. She was amazed at a feeling that someone else was replying for her. I've come to say a few things to you. He stopped to measure her with stern, speculative eye. Jane Witherstein loved this man. From earliest childhood she had been taught to revere and love bishops of her church, and for ten years Bishop Dyer had been the closest friend and counselor of her father, and for the greatest part of that period her own friend and scriptural teacher. Her interpretation of her creed and her religious activity and fidelity to it, her acceptance of mysterious and holy Mormon truths, were all invested in this bishop. Bishop Dyer, as an entity, was next to God. He was God's mouthpiece to the little Mormon community at Cottonwoods. God revealed himself in secret to this mortal, and Jane Witherstein suddenly suffered a paralyzing affront to her consciousness of reverence by some strange, irresistible twist of thought wherein she saw this bishop as a man and the train of thought hurtled the rising, crying protests of that other self whose poise she had lost. It was not her bishop who eyed her in curious measurement. It was a man who trampled into her presence without removing his hat, who had no greeting for her, who had no semblance of courtesy. In looks, as in action, he made her think of a bull stamping cross-grained into a corral. She had heard of Bishop Dyer forgetting the ministry in the fury of a common man, and now she was to feel it. The glance by which she measured him in turn momentarily veiled the divine in the ordinary. He looked a rancher. He was booted, spurred, and covered with dust. He carried a gun at his hip, and she remembered that he had been known to use it. But during the long moment, while he watched her there, was nothing commonplace in the slow-gathering might of his wrath. "'Brother Toll has talked to me,' he began. "'It was your father's wish that you marry Toll, and my order. You refuse him?' "'Yes.' You would not give up your friendship with that tramp, Fenners? No. But you'll do as I order, he thundered. Why, Jane Witherstein, you are in danger of becoming a heretic. You can thank your Gentile friends for that. You face the damning of your soul to perdition. In a flux and reflux of the whirling torture of Jane's mind, that new daring spirit of hers vanished in the old habitual order of her life. 
She was a Mormon, and the bishop regained ascendance. It's well I got to you in time, Jane Witherstein. What would your father have said to these goings-on of yours? He would have put you in a stone cage on bread and water. He would have taught you something about Mormonism. Remember, you're a born Mormon. There have been Mormons who turned heretic, damned their souls, but no born Mormon has ever left us yet. Ah, I see your shame. Your faith is not shaken. You're only a wild girl. The bishop's tone softened. Well, it's enough that I got to you in time. Now tell me about this Lassiter. I hear strange things. What do you wish to know, queried Jane? About this man. You hired him? Yes, he's writing for me. When my writers left me, I had to have anyone I could get. Is it true what I hear, that he's a gunman, a Mormon hater, steeped in blood? True, terribly true, I fear. But what's he doing here in Cottonwoods? This place isn't notorious enough for such a man. Sterling, in the villages north, where there's universal gun packing and fights every day, where there are more men like him, it seems to me they would attract him most. We're only a wild, lonely border settlement. It's only recently that the wrestlers have made killings here. Nor have there been saloons till lately, nor the drifting in of outcasts. Has not this gunman some special mission here? Jane maintained silence. Tell me, ordered Bishop Dyer sharply. Yes, she replied. Do you know what it is? Yes. Tell me that. Bishop Dyer, I don't want to tell. He waved his hand in an imperious gesture of command. The red once more leaped to his face, and his steel blue eyes glinted, a pinpoint of curiosity. That first day, whispered Jane, Lassiter said he came here to find Millie Earn's grave. With downcast eyes, Jane watched the swift flow of the amber water. She saw it and tried to think of it, of these stones, of the ferns, but like her body, her mind was in a leaden vice. Only the bishop's voice could release her. Seemingly, there was a silence of longer duration than all her former life. For what else? When Bishop Dyers did cleave the silence, it was high, curiously shrill, and on the point of breaking. It released Jane's tongue, but she could not lift her eyes. To kill the man who persuaded Lily Earn to abandon her home and her husband and her God. With wonderful distinctness, Jane Witherstein heard her own clear voice. She heard the water murmur at her feet and flow on out to the sea. She heard the rushing of all the waters in the world. They filled her ears with low, unreal murmurings, these sounds that deadened her brain and yet could not break the long and terrible silence. Then, from somewhere, from an immeasurable distance, came a slow, guarded, clinking, clanking step. Into her it shot electrifying life. It released the weight upon her numbed eyelids. Lifting her eyes, she saw, ashen, shaken, stricken, not the bishop, but the man. And beyond him, from round the corner, came that soft, silvery step. A long black boot with a gleaming spur swept into sight, and then Lassiter. Bishop Dyer did not see, did not hear. He stared at Jane in the throes of sudden revelation. Ah, I understand, he cried in hoarse accents. That's why you made love to this Lassiter, to bind his hands. It was Jane's gaze riveted upon the rider that made Bishop Dyer turn. Then clear sight failed her, dizzily, in a blur. She saw a gleam of blue and spout of red. In her ears burst a thundering report. The court floated in darkening circles around her, and she fell into utter blackness. The darkness lightened, turned to slow drifting haze, and lifted. Through a thin film of blue smoke she saw the rough-hewn timbers of the court roof. A cool, damp touch moved across her brow. She smelled powder, and it was that which galvanized her suspended thought. She moved to see that she lay prone upon the stone flags, with her head upon Lassiter's knee, and he was bathing her brow with water from the stream. The same swift glance, shifting low, brought into range her sight of a smoking gun and splashes of blood. Ah, oh, she moaned, and was drifting, sinking again into darkness, when Lassiter's voice arrested her. It's all right, Jane, it's all right. Did you kill him, she whispered. Who, that fat party who was here? No, I didn't kill him. Oh, Lassiter, say, that was queer of you to faint. I thought you were such a strong woman, not faintish like that. You're all right now, only some pale. I thought you'd never come too, but I'm awkward round woman folks. I couldn't think of anything. Lassiter, the gun there, the blood. So that's troubling you. I reckon it needn't. You see, it was this way. I come round the house and seen that fat party and heard him talking loud. Then he seen me and, very impolite, go straight for his gun. He oughtn't have tried to throw a gun on me, whatever his reason was, for that's meeting me on my own grounds. I've seen running molasses that was quicker than him. 
Now, I don't know who he was, visitor or friend or relation of yours, though I seen he was a Mormon all over, and I couldn't get serious about shooting. So I winged him, put a bullet through his arm as he was pulling at his gun, and he dropped the gun there and a little blood. I told him he had introduced himself sufficient and to please move out of my vicinity, and he went. Laster spoke with a slow, cool, soothing voice in which there was a hint of levity, and his touch, as he continued to bathe her brow, was gentle and steady. His impassive face and the kind gray eyes further stilled her agitation. He drew on you first, and you deliberately shot to cripple him. You wouldn't kill him. You, Lassiter? That's about the size of it. Jane kissed his hand. All that was calm and cool about Lassiter instantly vanished. Don't do that. I won't stand it. And I don't care a damn who that fat party was. He helped Jane to her feet into a chair. Then, with the wet scarf he had used to bathe her face, he wiped the blood from the stone flags, and, picking up the gun, he threw it upon a couch. With that, he began to pace the court, and his silver spurs jangled musically, and the great gun she softly brushed against his leather chaps. So, it's true. What I heard him say, Lassiter asked, presently halting before her, you made love to me to bind my hands? Yes, confessed Jane. It took all her woman's courage to meet the gray storm of his glance. All these days that you've been so friendly— and like a partner, all these evenings that have been so bewildering to me, your beauty and, and the way you looked and came close to me, they were woman's tricks to bind my hands? Yes. And your sweetness that seemed so natural, and your thrown little Fay and me so much together, to make me love the child, all that was for the same reason? Yes. Lassiter flung his arms, a strange gesture for him. Maybe it wasn't much in your Mormon thinking for you to play that game, but to ring the child in, that was hellish. Jane's passionate, unheeding zeal began to loom darkly. Lassiter, whatever my intention in the beginning, Faye loves you dearly, and I've, I've grown to like you. That's powerful kind of you now, he said, sarcasm and score made his voice that of a stranger, and you sit there and look me straight in the eyes. You're a wonderful strange woman, Jane Witherstein. I'm not ashamed, Lassiter. I told you I'd try to change you. Would you mind telling me just what you tried? I tried to make you see beauty in me and be softened by it. I wanted you to care for me so that I could influence you. It wasn't easy. At first you were stone blind. Then I hoped you'd love little Faye, and through that come to feel the horror of making children fatherless. Jane Witherstein, either you're a fool or noble beyond my understanding. Maybe you're both. I know you're blind. What you meant is one thing. What you did was to make me love you. Lassiter, I reckon I'm a human being, though I never loved anyone but my sister Millie Earn. That was long... Oh, are you Millie's brother? Yes, I was, and I loved her. There never was anyone but her in my life till now. Didn't I tell you that long ago I backtrailed myself from women? I was a Texas Ranger till, till Millie left home. Then I became something else, Lassiter. For years I've been a lonely man, set on one thing. I came here and met you, and now I'm not the man I was. The change was gradual, and I took no notice of it. I understand now that never satisfying longer to see you, listen to you, watch you, feel you near me. It's plain now why you were never out of my thoughts. I've had no thoughts but of you, and I've lived and breathed for you, and now when I know what it means, what you've done, I'm burning up with hell's fire. Oh, Lassiter, no, no, you don't love me that way, Jane Cased. If that's what love is, then I do. Forgive me, I didn't mean to make you love me like that. Oh, what a tangle of our lives. You, Millie Earn's brother— and I, heedless, mad to melt your heart towards Mormons, Lassiter, I may be wicked, but not wicked enough to hate. If I couldn't hate Toll, could I hate you? After all, Jane, maybe you're only blind, Mormon blind. That can only explain what's close to selfishness. I'm not selfish. I despise the word. If I were free, but you're not free, not free of Mormonism, and in playing this game with me, you've been unfaithful. Unfaithful, faltered Jane. Yes, I said unfaithful. You're faithful to your bishop and unfaithful to yourself. You're false to your womanhood and true to your religion. But for a saving innocence, you've made yourself low and vile, betraying yourself, betraying me, all to bind my hands and keep me from snuffing out Mormon life. It's your damn Mormon blindness. Is it vile? Is it blind? Is it only Mormonism to save human life? No, Lassiter, that's God's law, divine, universal for all Christians. The blindness I mean is blindness that keeps you from seeing the truth. I've known many good Mormons, but some are blacker than hell. You won't see that even when you know it. Else, why all this blind passion to save the life of that, that? Jane shut out the light, and the hand she held over her eyes trembled and quivered against her face. Blind, yes, and let me make it clear and simple to you, 
Lassiter went on, his voice losing its tone of anger. Take, for instance, that idea of yours last night when you went in my guns. It was good and beautiful, and it showed your heart. But why, Jane? It was crazy. Mind I'm assuming that life to me is as sweet as to any other man, and to preserve that life is each man's first and closest thought. Where would any man be on this border without guns? Where, especially, would Lassiter be? Well, I'd be under the sage with thousands of other men now living, and sure better men than me. Gunpacking in the West since the Civil War has grown into a kind of moral law, and out here on this border, it's the difference between a man and something not a man. Look what you're taking Venner's guns from him, all but made him. Why, your churchmen carry guns. Toll has killed a man and drawed on others. Your bishop has shot half a dozen men, and it wasn't through prayers of his that they recovered. And today he'd have shot me if he'd been quick enough on the draw. Could I walk or ride down into Cottonwood Woods without my guns? This is a wild time, Jane Witherstein, this year of our Lord, 1871. No time for a woman, exclaimed Jane brokenly. Oh, Lassiter, I feel helpless, lost, and don't know where to turn. If I am blind, then I need someone, a friend, you, Lassiter, more than ever. Well, I didn't say nothing about going back on you, did I? End of chapter 11